I am so, so, so excited. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Elena E. Roberts. Elena Roberts is the author of I've Been Here All the While, Black Freedom on Native Land, uh, and is an award-winning historian who studies the intersection of Black and Native American life from the Civil War to the modern day. She is an assistant professor of history at the University of Pittsburgh. And y'all, if you do not have this book, I'm telling you, this history shook me. I did not learn any of this in school, and I cannot wait to collaborate with all of the educators on this call about ways that we could bring this into our classroom, because especially now in this moment, uh, this history is so critically important. So thank you so much, Dr. Roberts, for your work, for being with us, for sharing your expertise and sharing all you've learned. I'm so looking forward to the conversation tonight and to learn with and from you. Well, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you everyone for coming this evening. Yeah, so we are going to dive right in with our first question, all about Reconstruction in the West. So your book takes an expansive view of Reconstruction, going beyond the South and beyond narratives that Reconstruction was mostly about African Americans gaining political rights. You write about Indian territory in present day Oklahoma, and as you say in your book, as a space where a different sort of Reconstruction project occurred that involved the successful pursuit of land. So to start, could you talk a little about why the history of reconstruction in the West is so important and what gets lost when we treat it as peripheral or when we don't learn about it at all? Well, so my research and my teaching are really connected. So right now at the University of Pittsburgh, I'm actually teaching a class that I've called the Black West. And so the basic premise of that class is that Black history doesn't just happen in the South, and it doesn't just happen on large cotton plantations. And so that is also really kind of the theme of my book, that there are all these different kinds of stories and histories and narratives and experiences that people of African descent have in North America that we don't learn about because we learn this kind of one narrow narrative that doesn't actually encompass you know, all of these things that people went through. And so for my book specifically, I focus on Black people who were owned as slaves by Native Americans. And so those Native Americans are from five Indian nations, the Chickasaw and Choctaw nations where my own ancestors were enslaved, the Cherokee, Seminole and Creek nations as well. And so when those nations were forced out of their homes by white settlers and the American government in the 1820s and 1830s, they and their slaves embarked on the Trail of Tears. So first of all, the Trail of Tears is both black and native history in my book. And these people then arrive in Indian territory, which is, as you said, now the state of Oklahoma. And so it wasn't white settlers who introduced black slavery to this part of the West. It was these Native American slaveholders. And so that's where my book really picks up, helping us understand this Native American and black removal and resettlement. And then kind of putting us in the idea that if we have slavery here, then we also have a reconstruction project when slavery in these Indian nations ends. Thank you so much for that. And I appreciate you naming that this is also Black history, right? As we think about the larger course content around uh, Teach the Black Freedom Struggle, that this is part of the longer Black freedom struggle. And I also want to name for everyone in the room that an excerpt from your book is actually appears in the Oklahoma vignette of the Zen Education Project Reconstruction Report. So please, please, please check out that report. It showed that that schools woefully uh, do not teach uh, the truth and the expansiveness about reconstruction. And this is just another reason why your work is so critically important to that history. And you talk about the five tribes. So in, in making a connection in the first chapter, you talk about how enslavement was rooted in the culture of the West long before the lead up to the US Civil War. So what should people know about enslavement and emancipation in the five tribes and how do they intersect with enslavement and emancipation in the United States? So there are definitely important similarities and differences. I think the most important similarity to remember is that there is no one kind of experience of enslavement in the United States or in any of these Indian nations. And so when I look at the sources, I see, of course, enslaved people talking about, you know, horrifically cruel owners who um, enjoy sadistic torture, who enjoy, you know, beating, whipping, raping, et cetera. 
But there are also enslaved people who say, you know, my owner viewed it as a labor system and, you know, they were kind to me. And this is, of course, not to excuse slavery, but to just kind of emphasize that enslaved people are aware of what's going on at different plantations. Their experiences are relative to what they know occurs in other places. And so we should take seriously, I think, the way they personally feel about what they're going through. Um, but for like the kind of interesting uh, similarities, there are also similar laws in all of these Indian nations that we think of as only in the United States. So the same laws that regulate the assembly of people, um, so stopping them from gathering in large groups, uh, laws that you know stop them from learning to read or write. Those same laws are present in all of these Indian nations because there is the same fear of rebellion, there's the same fear of an educated workforce that might be angry and then try to overthrow the system. Uh, but one of the important differences is that in Indian nations, Black men and women have the opportunity to serve as what we historians would call cultural intermediaries. And so they speak English and many of their owners do not. They have been previously exposed to Christianity and many of their slaveholders had not. And so they serve as translators, as proselytizers. Um, and for this reason, they're present at important meetings about trade and politics. Uh, sometimes this leads to their freedom, sometimes it doesn't, but it does, I think, give us different feeling of inclusion, almost like in these societies that they have these kinds of important roles that they often are not able to fulfill or hold in the United States. Um, but of course, you know, no matter what you're able to do in either space, you are dehumanized because you are not legally a person. Thank you. And you talked a little bit earlier about how this history uh, comes very much from your own history. And so the story that you tell in this book comes not just from your expertise as a historian, but also your perspective as a descendant of all four peoples in this narrative. So Indian freed people, African-Americans in the United States, native members of tribal nations and white settlers. And so it's really incredible to see the insights and the stories from your family and the way that you weave those in. So could you talk a little bit more about your definitions for each of those groups and what was it like to research and, and write this history? So as you mentioned, there are um, the Chickasaw and Choctaw Indian people who I specifically follow but I'm looking at all these slave holding nations. Um, there are white settlers, there are African-American settlers, and then there are what I call Indian freed people. And so I make this important distinction between the groups of Black people that I follow in this book because I'm trying to really get my reader to understand that everyone is not an African-American in this period of time. So people like my ancestors who live in the Chickasaw and Choctaw Indian nations, uh, that is their nationality. They live in a nation that is sovereign, that is not considered part of the United States. And so when they think about themselves and their identities, they're not thinking of themselves as American or African-American. And I think that's an important differentiation between the struggle of African-Americans and their desires to become American. Um, and so this kind of melds together when we get into the 1900s, but before that, uh, we do have these kinds of different groups. And so when I was in college, I went to school at UC Santa Barbara um, and I was really, you know, trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life, right? What all of us go through. Um, and so I knew I loved history. I knew I loved writing. And I was talking to my dad about a class I was taking. Uh, we had an assignment to do a family tree. And so I really started looking into some of this history that I knew some of the older people in my family had, but that I hadn't previously been interested in. And so one of the first documents I found was of my great, great grandmother, um, which I'll talk about later, but it was, it was amazing to really see this completely different story uh, about black identity and, and about mixed race identity uh, that was not part of the kind of African-American historical narrative. And once I learned about it, uh, I saw that it was not present in other things like documentaries, like other books um, about, you know, supposedly this all encompassing black experience. And so that really made me want to write a book that shows that we can think about the importance of the black freedom struggle and you know, how long it's really kind of been present in North America, but also the diversity within that struggle and what it means that different people want different things at different times and in different places. I appreciate that so much. And it's, it's making me think about history overall, right? How history is all around us and history is within us. And 
Throughout the Teach the Black Freedom Struggle course series, we've also heard from scholars like Clint Smith and Martha Jones and how they use their lineage and their own histories as a, as a, a grounding or a foundation to explore the larger Black freedom struggle. So just appreciating the work that you do and also the, con the larger connections that I just continue to see and thinking about all of the educators who are on this call that might teach oral histories in their own classrooms as a space for young people, for students to be able to see uh, their stories and their ancestry as history as well, alongside the information that they learn in school. And so uh, speaking more about stories and narrative uh, and, and moving more into some of the reconstruction work, most narratives really bookend reconstruction from the 1860s to 1877, ending with the removal of the last US troops from the South. But we know that it's not that simple and that understanding reconstruction really requires a longer lens like you share with us. And so you wrote about the 1860s to 1907 as a sort of prolonged reconstruction era in Indian territory. Uh, and so one thing that you also talk about is the Dawes Commission and how it played a major role in the land allocation process and its record holds powerful testimonies, including testimony uh, from your great great grandmother Josie Jackson. And so could you talk more about this prolonged reconstruction time frame in Indian Territory and the Dawes roles and I would love to just hear more about how you use Dawes Commission's records to draw out some of those voices and stories of Indian freed people who cultivated community while grappling with settler colonialism in this period. Well, listening to the introductions, it sounds like we have a very well-read audience. So it is probably not a surprise to many of you that there is still a lot of debate among historians about what reconstruction is, when it ends, when it begins, who is involved. Um, and so I am part of a group of scholars who is really trying to push the discipline to look at the West as a space where there is a different kind of project going on, one that is still though related to slavery, emancipation, as well as Native American history. And so I'm gonna kind of give you my spiel and hopefully persuade you uh, that reconstruction is important to really the entire nation. Um, and so if we think of reconstruction very broadly as a time period in which the federal government is attempting to rebuild physically like infrastructure, building railroads, um, but also politically and trying to really kind of change the nation to encompass new black citizenry. Um, all of these things are also happening in the West through the federal government. <clears throat> and so quickly, I need to back up and say that the five slaveholding Indian nations I mentioned all fight in the Civil War on two different sides, uh, just like in the United States. And so there are families split, there are nations split, uh, people fighting for the United States, people fighting for the Confederacy. They're fighting for multiple reasons, to protect their land, to get better treatment from the US, to protect the institution of slavery. And after the war, when different branches of the federal government are deciding on how former white Confederates will be punished or not punished, uh, the same decisions are being made about these Native American Confederates. And so what the Secretary of Interior at the time really decides is that he's going to punish these slaveholding Indian nations. And so he's gonna use the fact that they fought for the Confederacy against them um, essentially as leverage because there are about 14 battles actually fought in Indian territory. So this is you know, not just kind of a small thing, it really is actually involved in the war. Uh, and this destroyed people's homes, businesses, communities. And so these Indian nations desperately need help from the United States and the money that they're supposed to be getting from the United States. And so they're able to say, we want you to sign new treaties after the war, or we're not going to give you all the things that we owe you already. And so these treaties in 1866 uh, do all of these things that we think of Reconstruction doing in the United States. And so it forces these Indian nations to allow railroads to run through their nations. There's your infrastructure. Uh, it says that these nations have to free their slaves, give them citizenship in their nations, and also give them free land. And so when I mentioned um, about my family and, you know, the sources that I found, those sources are all tied to land and the fact that they really wanted to um, not just obtain that land, but also maintain that land and their presence on that land. And so all these sort of markers of reconstruction are present in these Indian nations. Um, and so when the Indian territory eventually becomes Oklahoma, it's because the federal government wants to really subsume this Western space into the United States. And so this process of 
land uh, selling. So first the land is um, given up in these treaties, hundreds of thousands of acres of land that was supposed to always be Indian nations. Uh, and then that land is supposed to be allotted to every native person and every freed slave in those nations. And then there will be surplus land conveniently uh, that can be lived on and settled on by white Americans. And so walking you through all of these things, um, the legislation that results in the sale of this land is the Dawes Act, which you mentioned, um, and then the Curtis Act. And so the Dawes legislation says that these five slave owning tribes have to uh, determine who all these people who are supposed to get this land are. Um, so who are all these native people who are members of this tribe? Who are all these former slaves who were owned in these tribes? In order to do this, they create roles. Those roles are called the Dawes roles. And there are two different roles. So there is the blood role, which is Native Americans by blood, by ancestry. And then there is the freedman role. And so the freedman role is the role of enslaved people and their children. And so a commission, the Dawes Commission, is put together to determine, you know, who are the rightful claimants to this land? Because there are plenty of people who, you know, come in after the war and try to get onto these roles because they see there's land being given out. And so there is a need for someone to really kind of arbitrate this process. Uh, but there are so many issues with this process, uh, a predominant one being the fact that there are many Black people who have Native American ancestry. Uh, and most of those people do not end up on the blood roll, the Native American role, for various reasons. A lot of them having to do with racism um, and the idea that Native people or mixed race people only look a certain way. But the roles themselves, as well as the process through which people get themselves on the roles is where I really have the richest sources. And so uh, when you apply to get your land and be on this role, you submit your name, your age, the community you live in, your relatives, uh, like your children, your husband. Um, you might have people come speak on your behalf and you yourself might be called to testify. And so that is the record of my own family that I found, uh, my great great grandmother Josie Jackson, um, I found her in front of this commission, telling them essentially why it's important for her to get this land, like why she wants to stay in this community, even though she's actually living in Dallas, Texas, which is hundreds of miles away from Ardmore, Oklahoma, where we still have that land. And yet she makes this journey back and forth constantly to see her family and to really maintain this connection to this space at a time when travel is very scary, especially for a woman. And so to me, that really kind of told me that the core of my book and of my story was land and what land meant to them, to my family members, but also to other groups within this time period because land was capital, but also land was identity, land was community, land was all these different sorts of things. Um, and so this process really kind of gives us um, the ideas that not just Black people, but also Native people have about um, where they live, where they want to live, and really the realization of Reconstruction's promise and how someone got land, someone got their 40 acres. It just wasn't African-Americans in the United States. Oh, yes. I'm like, there are so many different directions that we could go in for the next question, but I, I want to stick on the belonging first. And then I think we'll move to reparations after that, because you left us on such a, a good uh, closing sentence on that. And belonging is something that fascinates me so much. And I really just was drawn to your particular definition of it um, and how you talked about how folks did not always seek citizenship, um, but rather they clung to kin kinship networks and natal communities. Like you were talking about your great, great grandmother going back and forth. And so you note that the book's title, I've been here all the while represents in your words, both words spoken verbatim by numerous Indian freed people as a means to denote their long held connections to Indian territory and the sentiment that each wave of settlers in the West took on. So can you tell us more about the significance of that phrase, I've been here all the while and how Reconstruction's promise tied to into these ideas of belonging and citizenship and land within Indian nations and the United States. So when I mentioned my ancestor Josie Jackson's testimony, uh, that is essentially what she was saying that I have, you know, grown up on this land and this community and this is where I want to stay. But there were 
numerous uh, Indian freed people, um, these former slaves of native people who use those exact words. I've been here all the while. I, I have lived on this land. Um, some of them even talk about coming over on the trail of tears with their owners, really kind of driving home the importance of membership in that nation, but also how that new land is their home, just as we would think of it as Native Americans' new home. Um, and so this was kind of mind blowing to me because we don't think of land usually, I think, as being as important to African Americans or people of African descent as political rights. And so, yes, you know, of course, voting is so important. People died for that, right? But there is this other story because these people actually have access to land and the ability to obtain that where land is kind of their main focus and really the, the key part of their identity. And so making my book's title, I've been here all the while, is me really saying, I'm trying to speak for these people and say that you know land was important to them. Um, and so this land for most of these nations is tied to citizenship but for actually my family members, they never had citizenship. Um, and so they were living in a nation in which they did not have any rights um, after a certain period of time, um, where there was a, a certain threat of violence. And still, because they had that land, it was so important to them to stay in that space instead of journeying out into the United States when they could. Wow. Thank you so much. This, this history is just really mind-blowing and there's so much complexity and so much nuance that I think that you hold with so much care in both your writing and in the ways that you're expressing us expressing with us today uh, and as we talk about land um, what you write in your book uh, in terms of thinking about reparations you write in the process Indian freed people became the only people of African descent in the world to receive what might be viewed as reparations for their enslavement on a larger scale. So can you talk more about that and, and what the implications are for today? What does it mean for reparations today, especially when reparations in this case was built on violence and forced removal and seizure of native land? So I think there are multiple parts of reparations, at least two, maybe more. Um, and so we usually think of it as you know, there is kind of an apology, there is acknowledgement that a wrong was done, committed, um, by the representative of the nation um, or the group who did, you know, the wrongdoing, right? Um, and then we also have, you know, some sort of uh, land or monetary um, gift or, you know, whatever you want to think about the commodity or um, that is given to the people in kind of exchange for their sorrows and what they've suffered. Um, and so, you know, the 40 acres is there uh, for people like my family, the land is there, but it's not given by the Native American nations per se, it's given by the federal government, um, who is really kind of looking at people of African descent in these Indian nations and saying, okay, you know, we hear all this discussion in the United States about um, land, about the Freedmen's Bureau, about what could possibly be done to help African Americans be self-sufficient, that's not happening in the United States, but we can do it over here in Indian territory. We can give these people land. And that's because we're taking it from Native Americans. We're not taking it from white Americans in Indian territory. And so that makes it okay to these white men making these decisions. And so they're doing this, um, not necessarily out of the goodness of their hearts, but they are doing it kind of pointedly um, to provide a foundation, an economic foundation for these Black people. Uh, and it does. I mean, there is an economist who's done the work to show that Cherokee freedmen and Cherokee freedwomen actually do have um, more upward mobility, more education, um, a better sense of community because of this land. Um, but of course, it is also part of this greater uh, Native American dispossession. And so they're giving them land that isn't really theirs to give. Um, and also kind of solidifying this antagonism between Black and Native people. <clears throat> and so that, for me, makes it, I think, clearly reparations in the sense that these white Americans think that that's what they're doing, and economically that does make a difference. But on the other hand, the Native American nations who actually did the slaveholding are not themselves kind of acknowledging any sort of wrong. And if you look at today, what is happening with Native nations and the descendants of these former slaves, 
Uh, often there is still no acknowledgement, there is still discrimination. And so there is still very much a need for that kind of reconciliation. Now, as far as what it means for you know, greater reparations in the United States or across the world, I think it is a clear example that reparations can work in um, that at least in the 1890s, it could help a black family um, because they were starting from nothing, literally. Now there are so many decades of decades upon, you know, discrimination and ways that like things like redlining have hurt um, African-Americans and people of African descent. That's just so many more layers to strip away. But I, I don't think that that means that we shouldn't try and we shouldn't think through these ideas. It's just that I don't think we should be able to say it's never happened because it has, you know, someone thought that it was doable and took the time to, um, really kind of think it through and use it as, as almost an experiment on a group of people. Thank you. I appreciate you breaking that down for us so much. And uh, as a as a bit of a shameless plug, an Education Project for everyone that's, that's on the call uh, has a lesson where students actually design a reparation bill. So I think that this content, this, this history that you're sharing with us would be such a critical exploration with students alongside that lesson of what does it mean to have this conversation about reparations and what do we, how do we ask these critical questions about whose land, right? And, and who, who are the, the original stewards um, of this land in the, as part of those conversations. So I appreciate you bringing that into this space. And one of the things that you also named was the tensions between native and black folks. And so in a chapter uh, in your book, you write about the complexity of these interactions of Indian territory between African-Americans who moved from the South and Indian freed people. Uh, and you discuss the town of Boli in the Creek Nation as a prime example. And so how does the history of this particular town in present day Oklahoma even, how does this illustrate or further illustrate this complexity? Well, so Boli, Oklahoma is I think one of the most uh, well-known all black towns of Oklahoma, if you didn't know, um, Oklahoma is the state with the largest historical all black towns, which means that through the 1800s and early 1900s, there were hundreds of thousands of African-Americans going to these spaces, um, beginning their own communities. Um, and so because there are already black people here, these former slaves of Native Americans who are getting land, uh, Indian territory becomes a huge draw for African Americans from the United States. And so because they have been disappointed by the lack of help from Republicans in at least the kind of economic foundations of creating a new life after emancipation, um, they're looking really for places that are not just um, the potential to begin a new economically, but also uh, a place to be free from white violence, a place where they can, you know, create a store that's successful without a white neighbor coming by with a gun. Um, and so Indian territory looks to them to be, you know, a possible paradise, a place where there aren't many white Americans yet, especially none with um, power. Um, and because it is really kind of in an Indian run space, um, there is really an opportunity that isn't there in the United States. And so because these black people within these native nations are citizens, they're able to vote, they're able to serve on juries, they have all these things going on through the 1890s and into the early 1900s um, that for most black people in the South uh, is no longer possible, at least on a larger scale because of the huge rise in uh, Jim Crow and violence. And so when African-Americans come to Indian territory, uh, and the region outside of it, uh, they create towns, sometimes making alliances with Indian free people, with these former slaves of Native Americans. Um, and so Boli is an example of that because um, it originally starts as the allotment, uh, the land given um, to a Creek freed girl um, by the Dawes Commission. Um, and then, then it comes as really a place where speculators uh, are drawing people. So African-Americans come from the States, they create you know, schools, businesses, um, social organizations. Booker T. Washington visits the city and says it's an example of what Black ingenuity can create. And so it really becomes well known as a place that is the epitome of Black excellence. Thank you. 
And as we're talking about Oklahoma, um, Oklahoma, I think, is of particular interest for many different reasons. As we bring it to present day, a, a teacher was just fired for uh, sharing a QR code to the Brooklyn Library banned books. And you talk, uh, you refer to Oklahoma, of course, a lot in the book um, and Oklahoma land claims from whites, Indians and people of African descent over many waves of migration. You call it a powder keg that exploded in 1921 with the Tulsa race massacre. And so this was one of the single worst incidents of racial violence in US history and a direct attack on black wealth on Black Wall Street. And Oklahoma didn't incorporate the Tulsa race massacre into statewide school curriculum until 99 years later, as recent as 2020. And we think about all of the uh, newspaper articles and all of the archives that were essentially put away uh, and until, until recently. Um, and we see this continued um, thread of the erasure of critical history. And so can you talk a little bit more about the imp importance of students learning this history in light of our discussion today or in the broader history of the United States? And as we talk about that, I would love to invite folks, if you have questions for Dr. Roberts, we're going to uh, go into breakout rooms after we talk about this topic, uh, but please put your questions in the chat box so that we can curate them and we'll come back after our breakout rooms with more discussion and dialogue. But yes, can you talk a little bit more about the importance of students learning this history? So Tulsa's Black Wall Street is another space where Indian freed people mix with African Americans. And so you have these original land allotments that become communities um, where you have these different groups of Black people coming together, working together. Um, but it also is so emblematic of the change that happens once you kind of take Indian territory from a Native American space to a white American space. And so the Secretary of Interior and, and the federal government through him goes through all this trouble to ensure that Indian free people have land allotments, have rights, have membership in Indian nations, only for the federal government to then try to completely dismantle tribal nations um, and then really declare that Indian territory is going to become the new state of Oklahoma. And the state of Oklahoma, as you said, that introduces Jim Crow legislation that completely changes the lives of Indian freed people, as well as these other African Americans who come to join them. And then life is more similar to what they had tried to escape in the South. Uh, they do still have land and businesses that they created before statehood. They continue building on that, becoming even more successful. And now with the hundreds of thousands of white Americans who had come to settle in Oklahoma, they have to deal with uh, the jealousy, with the anger. And so in 1921, the Tulsa massacre then really becomes this kind of ultimate expression, I say in the book, to, to show that white supremacy is now the law of the land. So even though this place was formerly under native governance, even though formerly the federal government was ensuring that there was um, a measure of black rights in this space, when white Americans have claimed it, it changes. And so now the United States is really only protecting white settlers. And, you know, it's, of course, a huge travesty that Oklahoma students didn't learn about the Tulsa massacre for so long. But in my biased opinion, uh, it's even more devastating that they didn't learn the deeper history behind the region, because they need to know why, you know, why are Indian nations like the Cherokees even in Oklahoma in the first place? Why were all these Black people coming to Oklahoma and Indian territory? Um, all students need to learn about Native American dispossession, the way slavery was so important to the U.S. that they would encourage another group of people, Native Americans, to begin practicing it. And then, of course, that racial violence across the country disrupted the lives of African Americans and also Native Americans. And so this kind of story I tell in my book and how it connects to the Tulsa massacre is really a larger story of how uh, people of color relate to one another and interact. And I think a lot of that has also been censored in American history because looking at the way people have worked together and also been torn apart by white supremacy um, is important to, you know, not allowing us to work together in the present. Oh, yes. And I know we have to go into breakout rooms now, but when we come back, one of the things that I definitely want to talk about is solidarity. So looking forward to diving into that a little bit more. And I love uh, to just point everybody to the chat. There's so many great questions moving. And AMJ said questions that need answers, right? I'm, I'm just... <laughs> 
have so many ideas and so many thoughts for how uh, I could teach the Tulsa Race Massacre uh, more expansively now because of what you've offered and these critical questions that you're bringing. So thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. So Dr. Roberts, uh, in the chat box, Roberta had asked, what is the legacy of this history for the present day relationships between First Nations and African descended peoples? And so I'll also fold in my own question as part of that too, is can you share with us some of the stories of Black and Indigenous solidarity that have happened throughout history and, and even through present day as Roberta's question gets at? There are so many different times and spaces where Black and Native people were uh, laboring together, um, working together, intermarrying. Um, if we look at the kind of first, like very first interactions when people of African descent were first in North America, uh, they came with the Spanish. Um, a lot of them met Native people along with the same explorers who were, you know, killing Native people and taking their land. Um, and so they were antagonists, but they also, you know, intermarry and related on different levels. Um, during the colonial period, you have uh, Black and Native people working as slaves and servants on the same plantations, running away together, um, forming communities uh, that we might call maroon communities. Um, and it's really when you get into the 1800s that you see kind of more differentiated experiences where Native people have to really kind of decide, you know, where do we want to be in this racial hierarchy? Because Native Americans are looked at as different from people of African descent. Native people are looked at by um, founding fathers like Thomas Jefferson and George Washington as changeable, as people who can be assimilated, who can be converted to Christianity uh, versus Africans and African Americans who cannot be um, conveniently, of course, because they're needed for labor. Um, and so it's really up to Native people individually, but also as tribal nations to determine what their relationships with African Americans are going to be. And unfortunately, most of them choose uh, the path of least resistance, which is to really kind of accept that now these people are seen as inferior. Um, but going into the 20th century with the civil rights movement, with the Black Power movement, um, you also see a what's called the Red Power movement. So Native nations and Native people uh, working for their own kind of version of civil rights, which is not necessarily inclusion in the United States, but more so a recognition of tribal sovereignty and their differences with African Americans and other people of color. And so in thinking about the relationships between Black and Native people historically and today, we do need to remember that there are important differences because Native people have their own tribal nations, but there are very much, you know, a similarity between um, what they're fighting for against, you know, general prejudice, against discrimination, um, and the idea that they are, you know, in some lower tier of humanity. Thank you for sharing those stories because we, we know that when we ban history, we ban teaching truthful history, one of the biggest parts that we ban is teaching those stories of solidarity that allows us to see ourselves as in community with one another, as a force for social change, right? It's always been everyday people that have banded together in service of change. But you also talk about some of the, the challenges, right? And uh, in relation to some of the challenges in the chat, Joanna Kenty had asked, the group of the five civilized tribes that you mentioned, was enslaving a part of assimilation or was it more widespread among other tribes, other nations? Uh, the kind of participation that we see within these five tribes uh, in the system of slavery is definitely a part of why they are seen as more assimilated, more civilized than other native people. And so they are really the only five Indian nations that we look at as being involved in chattel slavery and the kind of the same model as white Americans. There are other Western Indian people like the Comanches who have black people in their nations as kind of a servant class, but it's not permanent in the same way that it is in the United States and in these five nations. Um, these people are also not seen as not human. They're just seen as kind of, um, you know, a source of labor, something to be traded, um, something to be bought, something to, you know, use to get something from white Americans. Um, and so it's, it's a different way of thinking that the five tribes allow to really grow within their nations. And it is part of their larger 
kind of change to adopting things like a similar government structure to the United States. So still to this day, these five nations have a judicial branch, an executive branch, and a legislative branch, just like the United States. They had newspapers, they had tribal leaders who were getting educated in the United States. And so they were very interested in assimilating to a certain degree that allowed them to be viewed as different and allowed them to gain enough kind of education and knowledge about the United States that they were able to um, bargain on almost kind of a different plane than a lot of other Native people. And as we talk about the five tribes, um, Bill Bigelow had asked, was there an abolition movement within these tribes? There was. Um, so all of these tribes, just like the United States, you know, there's like not one Native American experience or Native person um, and identity within these tribes. They are divided on many different issues. Uh, slavery is certainly one important issue that divides um, the nations. And so the, uh, the Creek Nation actually splits in two in the late 1700s over slavery and other issues because slavery is considered assimilation to a white American way. And so uh, Creeks and Seminoles are really split on, you know, do we want our nation to go this way? Are we interested in really changing ourselves to appeal to white Americans? Um, and so the Seminoles go off into Florida and are really not part of this same kind of development of slavery um, in these other nations until they are forced through removal to Oklahoma later on. Um, and so when we think about uh, abolition, I think we should think of it as in the United States as kind of a smaller group that has less power, but one that certainly represents a diversity of thought and identity in Native American nations. And as a follow-up question, Elizabeth asks, was there a resentment towards the five tribes like there was against whites in the South for enslavement? I wouldn't say so because it's not seen as the kind of primary reason that they fight in the Civil War. Uh, land and really kind of keeping their political identity is more important. So if I go into a little more detail with um, the beginning of the Civil War, the Confederacy is, you know, appealing to like different countries like France, um, you know, Britain for help in the war. And they also go to these other Native American nations um, and appeal to them saying, you know, we know that the United States doesn't treat you the way that it should. Uh, to the Cherokees, they say, we know that in your treaty, you have um, the right to send a representative to Congress and the United States has never done that. We will do that for you. Or we know um, that, you know, the Chickasaws and Choctaws, the US hasn't paid you the money for your land in the Southeast. We're gonna do that. Um, and so they really have these kinds of ways of trying to persuade Native Americans to work with them and to ally with them that uh, aren't even necessarily like related to slavery, but more so to um, the political identity of these nations as partners that have not been treated as such with the United States. Um, and so when we look at sources after the Civil War, it's more of just kind of anger at the United States, really at taking this um, war in which they didn't actually give Native people much help at all, and then using it to their advantage more so. Ooh, and there are so many great follow-up questions. The, the questions are just following up in the chat. So this is so engaging. Um, and so we have Miss Judy Richardson with us, SNCC veteran, documentary filmmaker. And so uh, Miss Richardson asks, as enslaved people with the five tribes, was there a way to end their enslavement or was enslavement auto automatically passed down as it was in the United States? Hmm. Was there a way to end their enslavement? Hmm. Is there a way to rephrase that question? I'm not sure I'm getting what she's asking. Let's see. Uh, Miss Richardson, would you want to come off mute? There you are. <laughs> okay. I'm muted. Okay. Here there we, we go. go. So sorry. Yes. Um, in the way that it's passed down automatically by the third generation, you're just automatically enslaved, right? And I'm trying to figure out if you're already on the plantation and second generation, third generation. Um, there's almost 
almost no way to get out of that unless you are allowed to buy your freedom. And even that is really, you know, slim, slim. So I'm trying to figure out, is there a way that it's not automatic that if you are on this plantation, your children and your children's children will always be enslaved? Definitely. Um, for the five tribes, yes. And so uh, if I go into something that I really didn't talk about in this uh, discussion, um, before African shadow slavery, Native peoples, just like people across the world, were engaged in like captivity practices where they, you know, would fight amongst themselves, go to war over territory or because they didn't like the other person or resources. Um, and they would take those people captive and those people would not become permanent slaves. Like they could move up, they could marry into families, their children were not slaves. Um, and so it's really the difference between this prior form and racialized African shadow slavery. And so that is why I say it's more like the United States um, because they are abiding by this different rule that means that you know race is permanent, um, slavery is permanent because it's tied to race. Thank you. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit because I know that this is something that you had mentioned um, wanting to talk about, and I, I certainly want to hear more about. And, and just thank you to everyone for your thoughtful and your intentional questions. Is, and thank you, Dr. Roberts, for diving into those questions, too. I know that there's, again, so much complexity and nuance in this topic. Um, and so moving into a little bit more about the storytelling piece with your family and your history, uh, Nicole V in the chat asked, did you find the information of your ancestors uh, via a public searchable electronic database or was this information, um, did it come from an actual archival research space? So there is like so much information for um, people like me whose ancestors were enslaved in these Native American nations um, because of this, this Dawes process, um, because they really are gathering so much information on Native American nations and the people within them. Um, and so because of that, I can use Ancestry.com, um, which now has all of these Dawes testimonies, all of the Dawes roles, um, Ancestry has also gotten a lot better with uh, more general African American records. Um, I think they have a lot of the pension records now, which have black soldiers in them. Um, there are other records that are like that you can find, you know, lists of online if you search like African American genealogical records. Um, but yes, for me, I use Ancestry. I used um, other archives where people can go in Oklahoma. Um, the Oklahoma Historical Society has a reading room where anyone can go for free to look at the Dawes roll. People will help you, um, but also other other things on microfilm if you want to look at microfilm, which is very frustrating sometimes. Um, but yeah, certainly there is far more information out there for not just groups of people like me, but for African Americans who want to try to um, trace the ancestry that, you know, for so long, many of us were not able to do. Um, and the communities now that are on Ancestry and on 23andMe are also really amazing for discovering people you're related to, you know, second, third, fourth, even more distant than that. And I've even... Um, gotten some help with my ancestry and the kind of information gathering that I'm doing on my own family through that. Wow. And I have a follow-up question. I'd be interested to hear, was there a favorite story that you uncovered from your family? So if, if you all out there um, read my book, then you will see that I have uh, interviews with various people in my family throughout the book. Um, most of whom have now passed on. Uh, and it was so amazing to talk to my second cousin, Travis Roberts, who was in his 70s, I think, when I talked to him. And he, he talked about how important it was for him to be recognized by the Choctaw Nation. Um, so if you, the, there was someone else who mentioned a question where they said they read an article about um, what it's like for descendants of these enslaved people in these current Indian nations and how it's, it's not so good, um, as I kind of mentioned. Um, and so when you are a group of people like my family, who first of all, you're not gonna see your story of enslavement in a textbook, you're not gonna see it in a documentary about slavery, um, but you know it, 
And you know that the nation that enslaved you really kind of denies it and is able to get away with not mentioning it in like museums and its own history. You can really feel invisible because people don't know your story. You know, the nation can ignore it, whereas the United States can no longer ignore slavery because of African-American activism. So it really felt amazing to be able to just tell his story. Like it's, it's in a book now, like no one can deny that that is his identity. God, like I'm all like, <laughs> I'm like tearing up because, you know, um, he never got that. And I just, I just wish that I could give him that. But what I gave him, I think was being able to write about it in my book. So this is so annoying. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's amazing. And and thank you. I just I'm I'm so moved that you have been able to uh, hold your family's stories in this way and, and to be able to write it down. Right. And, and, and to pass it down so that it isn't physical. Right. So that it doesn't get erased because that that information is there for everyone to read. And, and I know that I'm so grateful and I've learned so, so much. Um, from you and from your family's story. So it's it's very, very moving. And I, I see lots of appreciation flowing for you in the chat box as well. So I know that there are a couple of other questions and I will invite again, folks, if you have more questions, we have just a little bit of time. And uh, there is a question from Allison that says, we have some history in North Carolina of indigenous people being enslaved in the Caribbean. I'm curious to know that if that history intersects with any of this history that we're speaking of today, and what was the impact of exodusters and free black folks moving to Oklahoma and Indian territory on native land ownership and resource distribution? Um, well, I want to focus on the second part of that question because that's where I have more knowledge. Um, in my book, I talk about what it looks like when African Americans come into Indian territory and, you know, thousands in droves. Um, there is this kind of anger and frustration amongst some Indian freed people because Native American nations and individual Indian people get kind of scared because they see that they're kind of being overrun by these groups of people. They are a smaller population. African Americans are larger. And then along with white Americans coming in, there are all these people who are not part of their nation um, who, yes, uh, start, you know, some of them steal cattle, some of them squat on their land. Um, so they don't see this as kind of a positive development. And Indian free people then see that this is kind of affecting the way that they then view them uh, because sometimes then they're grouped into this larger black group and not seen as part of these Indian nations as they should be. Um, and so it, it, it is a negative kind of experience. And so that is the kind of tension that I talk about in the book because we wanna think of black migration as good, right? It's like, it's amazing that these people are kind of flee this, you know, the white violence that they're facing in the South, trying to build new homes and new communities for themselves. And yet when we look at, you know, honestly, some of the devastation that is wrought um, on Native nations and people by that migration, in addition to white migration, it, it's kind of a more complicated story. Um, because when someone else's freedom means that you are being dispossessed, uh, it's, it's more of almost a neutral than kind of just a win and just kind of a, a celebratory story, I think. <clears throat> now, there is, there is one question, um, if you don't mind, Sarah, that I wanted to respond to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Ian McCants is here. He's attending. Um, Ian is a fellow Freedman descendant, uh, as I am. Um, and so he's talking about reparations and how, you know, there are some free people who are uncomfortable with the way that I situate that. And I think that is, I wanted to highlight that because those are two separate identities for me sometimes. So I'm a historian, I'm also a Freedman descendant. And so as a Freedman descendant, I understand that, uh, you know, reparations, as I've said, are not clear cut. It doesn't mean that Native nations treat people like my family any differently or think any differently about us. Um, and they didn't want to help our families. But I do think that when you look at the different parts of the federal government, 
um, that are not just Henry Dawes, but are also the Secretary of Interior, James Harlan, also the Dawes Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Dole. Um, all of these people have different ideas about what land means for Black people. And so even if even if they are like themselves have racist ideas about Black people, even if they themselves are not thinking about what that's going to mean down the line um, in terms of incorporating this land into the United States, I still think it's a historical moment that we have to acknowledge as different from what's happening in the United States and as part of a reconstruction um, experiment. And you know, I'm, I'm not going to convince everyone, and that's totally fine. Um, but I think as historians, when we look at the sources, we have to look at how people intend for projects to work. And we have lots of different parts of the federal government coming together to you know, make a difference for at least my family. And the difference isn't the same for everyone, certainly. And it's not a racial paradise, even with these land allotments. But it is an important and different story. I appreciate that. Thank you. And I, I saw too that there were uh, there was a, a follow up question um, as you were talking about the different ways that you kind of looked into archives and ancestry um, to tell the stories of your family. And so Roberta had asked specifically, did you use the records of the American Colonization Society? I did not, but I, I know what you're getting at there. And um, there is a book by a historian called, um, her name is Kendra Field. Um, the book is called Growing Up With The Country. And she follows uh, members of her family who traveled to Indian territory and then to Africa. And one of her great, great ancestors like became a leader who actually brought people back, or well, not back to Africa, but to Africa. Um, and so she talks about what we think of as kind of like a, a migration that is almost circular. And so you have people, African Americans, who are looking for this racial paradise that doesn't exist, like looking for a space where they really can create a new aside from discrimination. And so people go to Indian territory, they go to Kansas. So we mentioned the Exodusters, they go to California, they go to Liberia, looking for a place. And, you know, um, of course, there is no perfect space. And so they, sometimes stay at some of these spots, sometimes they move on, sometimes they go back to the South. Um, but certainly that again is another important way of thinking about African-American history that takes us not just out of the South, but also out of the kind of great migration paradigm, I'd call it, because you have so much movement before then. Wow, mm. very interesting. And so as we near the end of our conversation today, I'm going to ask our, our last question before we invite folks for some feedback. Um, so right now we are living at a time where 42 states and counting have either introduced or passed legislation that bans teaching the truth about racism and oppression in schools. And much of the rich history that we've talked about today uh, is either banned and or maybe banned in many places. So what words of inspiration might you leave us with? Might you leave this group of educators and activists and historians and students uh, and loved ones and community members and librarians? What, what would you leave us with as words of inspiration as we continue to double down in our efforts to teach the truth regardless of the law, recognizing that you teach this truth every day too? I mean, those of you who teach in K through 12, I feel like you are far more on the front lines than I am. And I just, I have so much really kind of admiration for you all because it is, it's scary out there now. Um, and I'm just, I am thankful that you're here tonight to um, learn from some of the work that I do. And I hope that you can find a way to incorporate it in your teaching in a way that makes you feel comfortable and also really help students see themselves more in this kind of historical narrative that often um, excludes not just people of color, but other narratives like that of, you know, impoverished white people of different kinds of inequality through, you know, economic hierarchies. Um, so that, you know, I don't know, I don't know how to be inspiring when really I'm the one inspired by you all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so much appreciated too. And I see moving in the chat box, all of the, all of the educators that are like, we truth, we teach the truth all day, every day. 
So you are uh, certainly in, in good company. And I know that so many folks will take everything that they've learned today and bring it back to their classrooms, whatever their classrooms might look like. Um, at this time. And thank you so much for sharing your expertise, for sharing your stories, for sharing your family stories with all of us. Uh, it's so appreciated to be able to, to learn about these narratives, to have a more expansive view of history. And it helps us to learn uh, the truth and how we can really take that truth as a, as a launching pad to be in solidarity with one another, to be able to create the world that we all deserve to live in. And so thank you all to everyone who has been tuning in for this conversation. Dr. Roberts, I've learned so much both from reading your book and also being able to be in conversation with you uh, to hear more of those nuances in the stories. And, and we thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Dr. Roberts. Dr. Roberts, moving and brilliant. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.